It's Supreme Court Day here on Stu Does America. I mean, it's pretty much Supreme Court Day every day these days, it seems. We'll be looking at uh, the latest released opinions and taking a look back at my conversation with Coach Kennedy, whose story was the centerpiece of one of the major opinions. Uh, let's get right to it and do the craziest SCOTUS term ever. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to subscribe to Blaze TV. Don't forget to go to StuDoesMerch.com as well to get your 624-22 merchandise. Yes, the date that we will remember for a very long time on the pro-life side of the aisle. And the good part about this is it's not in everybody's face. You're kind of making your statement. You're letting it stand uh, and kind of speak for itself. And uh, you can check it out there. Use the code Stu10 if you want to save 10%. Um, the the this we over the past like what three or four weeks we spent a ton of time on the Supreme Court seemingly more time than I can ever remember spending on it we've always talked about it on this show and on radio as I've mentioned a few times these decisions come down in hour two of radio every single time it's always hour two of radio so I'm constantly in the middle of you know hearing Glenn blah, 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 talking about something I don't know end of the world uh, eventually you'll get shot in the head whatever it is and I have to sit here and read these things in real time and kind of try to understand them. So we've always talked about them. You know, about 80 or 90 percent of the cases they take and decide are pretty boring and they're not really worth talking about. That wasn't the case this time. And partially, this is because the court is actually looking at the Constitution again. So this has become from a place where it's like, hey, let me describe to you why you're disappointed today to something actually interesting and fun. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of winning. Uh, a lot of winning going on. You know, uh, Sarah Gonzalez over at News and Why It Matters, we were talking and she said, you know, I'm not tired of the winning. And I remember President Trump saying that he went along to, uh, to name some pretty good Supreme Court justices and the winning has been nice and President Trump was wrong. I mean, I'm not, I'm not tired of it at all. Uh, so anyway, I do like that, uh, that part of the Trump administration has gone pretty darn well. Now, not every single time, the worry, I think, for conservatives, more than anything else, was you got the three liberals, you got Roberts, who's basically a liberal on most things, and then who's the next one? Can they get one more? And the worry part, we've mentioned it a hundred times on the show, we mentioned it as we were going through the confirmation hearings, the guy I'm kind of worried about is Kavanaugh. Now, one of the cases that came out today kind of enforced that. It was the, uh, reinforced it. It's uh, the immigration opinion. And this is uh, the Supreme Court case basically on the remain in Mexico part of uh, the uh, Trump administration. Uh, the immigration thing was going on. He said, you got to stay in Mexico while you're awaiting your hearings for asylum. Uh, that the, of course, Biden administration came in, wanted to overturn that. They were blocked by the lower courts from doing so. However, the Supreme Court said, yeah, you know, you can do it. This is, of course, the problem more than the Supreme Court here. The problem with not having legislation to back you up. If you're just the executive branch doing things and saying, I really want to do these things, they can always be unwound by the, la the next guy in line. And, all, you know, Biden's doing this now. He's doing all sorts of uh, big executive actions and over, they're getting overturned or they will be overturned by the next president if they're not overturned by the courts. And I think the best part of today is because we can talk about the border thing maybe a little bit later. Uh, but the biggest one was this EPA case. And this is the case I've been really honestly excited about secondarily, secondary only to the, the Dobbs case, which was Roe versus Wade and abortion. Now, that, of course, is the biggest Supreme Court case of them all. We've been talking about every single Supreme Court justice that has been confirmed over the past 50 years has had to talk about it. And that one's the biggest one. We spent a ton of time on that. Not as much attention is going to this EPA case. And what I would talk about here is it's not just about the EPA. It's not just about climate change. It's not just about West Virginia. It is a case that is, can be, I, I hope, as far reaching as uh, any other in this particular uh, Supreme Court session. And what's interesting about it is unlike, let's say, the abortion case, which the abortion case, look, is really important and it's the most important uh, decision in my opinion. But like most people don't have abortions. 
thankfully. A small percentage of people, obviously, and this is going to shock some of you on the left, but only half the population is even capable of being pregnant in the first place. I know that's a little controversial these days, but it's pretty much the ladies that have to talk about abortion. And almost all the ladies do not have abortions. You know, some do. And I don't think uh, that's a great thing. But it doesn't hit everybody. The Second Amendment, you know, there's a lot of guns. There's 400 million guns in this country, more guns than people. But a lot of people have more than one. <laughs> Not sure if you've ever noticed this. Uh, it's only like something like 40 percent of people that even own guns. The majority of this country does not. Just the fact that some people who do have like 800 of them. Uh, but uh, the majority do not. So and the majority, uh, 42 of the 50, 43 of the 50 states didn't have the restrictions that New York had on gun owners walking around with their guns and carrying publicly. So that wasn't really a big issue. Um, the carbon dioxide one with the EPA does hit everybody. It really does. It's a, a big deal. And let me give you the 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 end of this, the decision here, and we're going to work backwards from there. Uh, capping carbon dioxide emissions at a level that will force a nationwide transition away from the use of coal to generate electricity may be a sensible solution to the crisis of the day. But it is not plausible that Congress gave the EPA the authority to adopt its own such regulatory, regulatory scheme. A decision of such magnitude and consequence rests with Congress itself or an agency acting pursuant to a clear delegation from that representative body. The judgment of the Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia is circuit uh, is reversed and uh, cases are remanded for further proceeding consistent with its opinion. It is so ordered. Kids, take out the garbage. It is so ordered. That's how I talk all the time at home. My kids love me. This is a part of what the uh, Obama administration did. And it's a good little lesson because with Roe versus Wade, they learned a lesson. They said, hey, when we change the rules and get rid of the judicial filibuster, what happens? You lose Roe versus Wade. That's what happens in a few years. Uh, another uh, situation here. Barack Obama went through much of his presidency admitting he could not do what he tried to do. He said, I don't have the power. I need Congress to act. I can't do it on my own. And then he got reelected and said, I got a pen and I got a phone. And you know what? He used that pen and that phone to do uh, all sorts of maneuvers that are now uh, clearly shown to be in, in, incorrect, illegal, unconstitutional. He tried to regulate power uh, company or er, uh, power stations. Uh, by fiat. Go, hey, I really want it. Can I have it? Wait, you're saying that they won't give it to me through Congress? What if I just do it? I'll just do it instead. Uh, the Supreme Court on Thursday reversed the D.C. Uh, Circuit's ruling. Roberts wrote, Roberts, that's important, wrote the EPA's effort to regulate greenhouse gases by making industry-wide changes violated the major questions doctrine. We'll get into that here in a second. The idea that if Congress wants to give an administrative agency the power to make decisions of vast economic and political significance, it must you know, say so clearly that would be preferable. Uh, Robert's full throated embrace of the major questions doctrine, a judicially created approach to statutory interpretation in challenges to agency authority likely will have ripple effects far beyond the EPA. His reasoning applies to any major policy making effort by federal agencies. Amen. Yes, it does. And yes, it should. Now, they kind of take a shot at the major decisions doctrine there. And basically, that just says, look, if you're going to do something that's going to re rework the entire economy, you've got to pass a freaking law. You can't, just, you can't just do it. You can't just find some vague statement in the Clean Air Act from a zillion years ago and say, well, we know it's never been applied like this, but what we think it means is we can control everything. That's not the way this is supposed to work. And the major questions doctrine is just a way to kind of separate the, uh, the big from the small, right? Um, uh, to say, okay, look, um, if we say you must make grilled cheese sandwiches, okay? You can talk about what, kind, what size the bread is. You know, maybe the agency can decide, well, will there be sesame seeds on this bread? Will it be rye? Will it be white? Obviously, the answer to that is white, but that's a whole other story. Uh, will it be, uh, can you put tomato on it? Eh, okay, you're starting to push it a little bit here. But can it be 
uh, made, uh, instead of bread, you use, I don't know, chocolate bars. And the cheese, we're gonna use cream cheese. Well, no, that's not a grilled cheese sandwich, okay? So if you wanna change, if you want to make sandwiches made out of chocolate and cream cheese, which is starting to sound delicious, you can do that, but you've got to pass a freaking law to do it. That's the major questions doctrine. And it's pretty clear that if there's little things around the edges, little tiny things that are not particular, uh, specifically uh, clarified in a law, it makes sense that someone can you know, to understand it and, and interpret uh, the law a little bit from one of these agencies just because we'd be caught up forever in every one of these little decisions. Now, there's questions about that as well, but it is an understandable doctrine. You can't just pass laws through executive fiat. We are supposed to all be united on this. We got all the same documents in front of us. Um, and elites should not have this much power. The president shouldn't be able to just do everything. This was the vision of, let's say, Woodrow Wilson, for example. Uh, We've talked to you before about the the book, Philip Drew Administrator. It was uh, Woodrow Wilson's favorite book. Uh, It is a terrible book. It is a book about how, what if we had a government that just had experts in it and they just did the things instead of having to pass laws, you just give the power to the experts and they'll do everything. And, you know, a lot of people on the left, if you've noticed over the COVID period, really like that formula, right? Give the decisions to Dr. Fauci. Let him make all of them, right? That's, that's their idea. Uh, Woodrow Wilson loved this as well. And uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch uh, wrote a concurring opinion. Uh, and Robert's opinion was, was good. It was pretty strong. And the fact that it was a 6-3 opinion with Roberts really shows there's teeth behind this. They, they, can, they can afford to even lose Roberts if they push this farther. And I hope they do, because this should be as clear as possible. But Gorsuch wrote in a concurring opinion that, you know, maybe elites shouldn't have this much power. Because sometimes they're wrong. And he you in a in a uh, footnote that seemed specifically designed to get Glenn Beck to date him. Uh, <laughs> He wrote this. For example, Woodrow Wilson famously argued that popular sovereignty embarrassed the nation because it made it harder to achieve executive expertness. In Wilson's eyes, the mass of the people were selfish, ignorant, timid, stubborn, or foolish. He expressed even greater disdain for for particular groups defending, quote, the white men of the South for ridding themselves by fair means or foul the intolerable burden of governments sustained by the votes of ignorant African-Americans. Yeah, you really want to give power to people like that, right? He, uh, like Wise, denounced immigrants from the south of Italy and men of the meaner sort out of Hungary and Poland who possessed neither skill nor energy nor any initiative of quick intelligence. To Wilson, our republic tried to do too much by vote. This is the problem. You can't just give power to these experts because, you know, the experts aren't always right, guys. I don't know if anyone's noticed that over the past couple of years. Maybe you have. Uh, Really, Gorsuch boiled this whole thing down, I think, really, really well as he talked about how this country is supposed to operate. And he's done this several times. I mean, Gorsuch, there's been some stuff where people have kind of crinkled their brow, especially when it comes to Native American issues. He seems to be, he takes some interesting positions on those issues, but he's been right on a lot of this stuff and he's very good on the administrative state. He writes, the difficulty of legislating at the federal level aimed as well to preserve room for lawmaking by governments more local and more accountable than a distant federal authority. So, you know, it's not supposed to be easy for you to pass every law that you have at a whim. The, the federal government, our founders decided that they wanted the federal government to have less power and give more power to the states and local authorities. If you're gonna pass laws, pass them there. Uh, and in this way, they wanted the, uh, the states to serve as laboratories for novel, uh, novel social and economic experiments. Permitting Congress to divest its legislative power to the executive branch would dash this whole scheme. Amen. Legislation would risk becoming nothing more than the will of the current president, or worse yet, the will of unelected officials barely responsible to, uh, responsive to him. In a world like that, agencies could churn out new laws more or less at a whim. Intrusions on liberty would not be difficult and rare, but easy and profuse. Yes, this was the vision of our founders. This is what has made America great. It's why we kick everyone's ass. It's, it's that thought. It's not the federal government and all, you know, all their enlightened experts implementing all of their wildest hopes and dreams on you without even passing a bill. No, no, 
Absolutely not. That was never part of the way this country was formed. It was never supposed to be the way it is. But it's become so per- pervasive throughout our government that I feel like we don't even notice it anymore. We don't even think about it. Oh, well, you know, Biden's got control of the EPA. I guess he's going to do X, Y, and Z. No, that is not how it works. You have a Congress that passes a law that outlines exactly what they're trying to do. So all your elected representatives are on the hook for it. And then the EPA can help implement it. They're not supposed to make it up as they go along. But the left has come up with this alternative form of government. They've been doing this for decades, and their form of government is, hey, we have the EPA, and under our control, we'll put them all with bureaucrats that basically stay there forever, and then we'll have those people pass all sorts of ridiculous restrictions, the bigger the better, and when they get shot down and someone calls us out on it and says, hey, wait a minute, that's way too much, that's too big of a move, you're changing the whole economy, we'll go to the Supreme Court, and of course, the Supreme Court will be a dependable ally in this battle. And that's how it's been for years and years and years and years and years, until very, very recently, where now the Supreme Court isn't allowing them to go forth with it anymore. And the best part about this is it's precedent, right? We know the left loves precedent, they never wanna change anything. Well, the court has ruled here, and what they're saying is, Until something drastic changes in the Supreme Court, until something totally upends this, when you have a decision that's impactful, the EPA, for example, the FDA, none of these agencies are going to be able to make those choices on their own. They're going to get challenged, and the lower courts, hopefully, will be overturning those things. Gorsuch, uh, I want to end it with this because I, I love this. When Congress seems slow to solve problems, it may be only natural that those in the executive branch might seek to take matters into their own hands. But the Constitution does not authorize agencies to use pen and phone regulations as substitutes for laws passed by the people's representatives. I mean... He called out Obama specifically there. Do you remember him saying, I've got a pen and I've got a phone and I'll do whatever the F I want. That's that's a paraphrase. That's pretty much what he said. That's what Obama said, the pen and the phone thing. That was his argument. He's able to do these things because he's president. And because he's president, he's got all the power. He can do what he wants. No, you don't. It's not what the Constitution says. It's not what our form of government is. And now the Supreme Court has ruled that way, and you're not going to be able to do that stuff anymore. It is so ordered. From cringing at the pump, to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, dines out. Whatever you're doing, Upside can be there to help you. With every purchase, you can earn cash back thanks to Upside. I went to the gas pump, and as you may know, gas prices are a little high right now. And I went on the Upside app, and you know what I got? 25 cents off a gallon. 25 cents off a gallon. That's a big, big freaking difference. And, you know, you can do this. It can also be restaurants and all sorts of things. You just, you just get started. You, get, uh, you can download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. You can use the promo codes to get five bucks uh, or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. And then you can claim an offer whenever you're buying on Upside. You can check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit card, uh, and then you get paid. It's awesome. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. You can kind of layer them on top of each other. You can both. Why not? You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an gift card for Amazon and other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week, and that's probably why they got the 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use the promo code STU to get five bucks or more cash back on your first purchase of 10 bucks or more. It's five bucks or more cash back on your first purchase of 10 bucks or more using the promo code STU with Upside. You know, the last couple of weeks have been filled with monumental Supreme Court opinions being released and things that are earth shaking, obviously, 
We know the Roe versus Wade situation was probably the biggest one, but there have been a lot of stories, a couple of them on religious liberty that have happened. There was one in Maine. That was a big deal and went the right way, thankfully. And there was one in uh, with the Coach Kennedy situation. Uh, CNN reported on the Coach Kennedy situation, of course, and I, for some reason they put Jeffrey Tubin in the player, which, again, th- you never want to look at your computer and see Jeffrey Tubin looking back at you. <laughs> that just never ends well, uh, as we've learned over the years. Um, anyway, so uh, Coach Kennedy was victorious, and that is a really important thing for religious liberty. Of course, First Liberty Institute worked really closely uh, with uh, Coach Kennedy on this. In fact, they joined us, uh, Jeremy Dice from First Liberty Institute, along with Coach Kennedy a while ago. And I, I want to revisit this interview because if you've heard anything about the story, it's been so misreported by the media who wanted to make you think that this guy was like, bringing people on religious retreats and recruiting kids and saying, you won't play quarterback unless you pray. That's not what happened at all. I want to revisit this interview and give you the real story from Coach Kennedy's very own mouth. I'm joined now by Coach Joe Kennedy and First Liberty Institute's Jeremy Dice. Guys, how's it going? It's good. Thanks for being here. Yeah. um, You guys have, there's a long story here and I want to get to all of it. It, to, to, to jump ahead to the end, there's a Supreme Court case coming up. You're the focus of it. Yeah. How weird does that feel? Beyond weird. Yeah. I mean, imagine some guy from Bremerton, Washington. Go look it up on a map. Nobody <laughs> knows where it is. Right. And here I am, part of it. It's like high school football coach, Supreme Court. That's odd. It's, it's wild. I want to I go through the whole, the whole story about how you got there. But let's go back to the beginning of your life first. Yeah. Because... The, uh, maybe even more shocking than a, uh, a coach going to the Supreme Court is you, w- with your beginnings, rising up and being uh, a focal point of the Supreme Court. I can't imagine that's what you thought was going to happen with your life back <laughs> no. in the day. Tell me, yeah. I, so t- tell me how, how everything started for you. Uh, everything started, you know, I, I, I'd say from my youth. You know, I was one of those troubled youths. Uh, nobody wanted in and out of f- foster homes, group homes, uh, boys' homes, those kind of things. Mm. So everybody told me, even the nuns at school, hey, yeah, you're not going to amount to nothing. You're going to, you know, you're you're just, you don't contribute to society. And it kind of made me a fighter and joined the Marine Corps, obviously. That was a good fit, needed the discipline. Did that for 20 years. Because you weren't necessarily (laughs) the best kid, would you say? No, no, I was the worst kid. Yeah, (laughs) The single worst kid ever. Yeah, I'd be in the top ten probably. Really? Oh, yeah, I got kicked out of every school from third grade on. Really? Yeah. And what over what? Just normal shenanigans? How far did you go? Yeah, it started out that. And um, I didn't get along with my parents. They had natural kids, which, you know, I was adopted. So it kind of pushed us all apart from each other and... Kind of went down the wrong road from there. Yeah, yeah, because you were adopted, um, and then you're at that point that you were adopted because your the parents who adopted you did couldn't have biological right, kids, right? That is correct. Yeah. And then they had them, and they were like, ah. Yeah. After five others, they're like, oh yeah, we don't need that one anymore. Gosh. And but I mean, I was a terror. So I, I hold nothing against <laughs> right. them because I wouldn't put up with me. I would have killed me a long time ago. <laughs> so you go to the Marine Corps, and this does this does this help? Does this turn you around? Does, do you get the sense of discipline that you felt you oh, needed? Oh, yeah, and, and part of a team. I was um, greater than some than myself, and it was a really a proving stone for myself because everybody says you're never going to mount to anything. So I wanted to know if I actually could. Oh, I wanted to prove them wrong, but I also wanted to prove to myself that I could do something incredible with my life. Okay, so you get you go through uh, the military. What happens next? I just retired, and I was out on a run, and athletic director from Bremerton Schools stopped me in the middle of my run and chatted me up and offered me a job, and I applied, and there it was. So how did you, I mean, were you a big player? Did you, <laughs> what, 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 how did you get this gig? It, it, we still wanted that to this day. <laughs> uh, the head coach, when we had the interview, he says, why, why would I hire you? You know nothing about football. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't. I mean, X's and O's, it's not my thing at all. Mm-hmm. I said, but I will make you a great team and I will get the most out of all the players and all the coaches. I will do everything in my power to develop a team and get leadership and take us to the next level in that arena. So you become a coach and you start 
uh, <laughs> without real knowledge of X's and O's, and you become a coach, but you but you you're looking to improve them as as men. As you're trying to to turn this into a team of men. That's exactly it. And part of this process is something you do after the games. Right, and and that I was a brand new um, baby believer. You know, just within a year of uh, finding you know my relationship with God. Really, and. It, I mean, everything just all rolled in together all at once. It was just really odd how God put it all together. Weird sense of humor he has picking me to do this stuff. So, so why did you start? Because you started praying after the games. Why? Right. I, I was watching uh, Facing the Giants. I don't know if you mm. saw the movie. Mm. But in the movie, the coach was going through great turmoil in his life. And I felt the same way. And it was an answer call. They offered me that job on a Friday, and that movie came on over the weekend. And mm. I fell to my knees and said, I'm all in. You don't get an answer all the time. And that was a diehard answer. And I just from right there said, that was my covenant with God. I will give you the glory after every game on the battlefield. Mm. Now we're getting Jeremy Dice uh, as well. Jeremy, of course, with First Liberty and Stupid on the show many times. Um, it, the left would say that's not okay. The media would tell us it's not okay to have the coach praying with kids, it's against the separation of church and state, as you know, directly in the Constitution, uh, Jeremy. I can never seem to find it, but they tell me it's there. Uh, when people say that, how do you how do you explain this to them that this is not against the rules? Well, in this case, we've got to be very clear. Coach, all he wanted to do is pray by himself at the 50-yard line after the game. That was his whole covenant mm. with God to do that by himself. Over time, it evolved that students started to join him, and it became sort of a, a, a motivational speech afterwards with religious content. When the school district found out about it, oddly enough, through a compliment, uh, they investigated it, as, of course, because it's a government agency. They have to do an investigation of these things. Of course. And they said, look, you're praying with the kids afterwards. That needs to stop. Coach said, okay, no problem. I understand that. I may mm. have my opinion about that, but that's not what I covenanted with. What I promised to do with God has nothing to do with other people. It just involves me. Sure. And so I'd like to continue to be able to take a knee for 15 or 30 seconds on the 50-yard line, thanking the Lord for the, the game that we just played. And they still said no. Uh, and so that part is what's under consideration now with the Supreme Court of the United States. Is it sufficient to coerce other people and therefore violate the Establishment Clause just because those students can see Coach engaged in what they call demonstrative religious activity at the 50-yard line of a public school's football field? I, because, Coach, you didn't say, hey, you're not going to get any targets at wide receiver if you don't come pray at the 50-yard line. This was not your approach. <laughs> no, especially when I'm just a JV coach, you mm. know, so I have nothing to do with the varsity lineup, who plays, who doesn't. I'm trying to squeeze everybody in. Yeah. Now, with JV, I had full control, and everybody played. We're not worried about winning the game. It's developing those players right. and to be better young men and getting to the varsity level. So I don't care if you – we had special needs kids on our, on our team. They play. Every single person plays on JV. And so some of the kids initially tried to come out and pray with you. Um, you Did you have to tell them, essentially, no, you can't come out here and pray with me? No, the school has a very um, um, weird rule, and it's the only one that applies to uh, anything with religion, as far as I could read. And it says that you cannot encourage nor discourage kids in prayer. So I couldn't say, don't come out here, and I can't say... Please come out here, you know. I mean, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But we worked really hard to get to the point where I thought we were on the same sheet of music, and it was, you don't pray with the kids, everything's going to be okay. And I thought we were set. I told my team, hey, I, I, I know where you guys' heart is. I know you want to join, but you're not going to. We don't want any more problems. And they were totally understanding. And which I think technically breaks the rule you were just talking about because you had to discourage <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, you to have not to be very there. creative with your words. And <laughs> right. You do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. I'm not telling you no. <laughs> Does the government have any role here, Jeremy, in, in determining whether a coach decides to pray after a game? <laughs> Back in the 1960s, the Supreme Court said that uh, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates. We know that in that case is talking about student speech. So we know the answer to that question. This is really the case that will determine the other side of that equation. What about teachers and coaches? Do they shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates? Uh, we believe that the Free Exercise Clause protects private acts of worship like this silent prayer for 15 to 30 seconds after the game at the 50-yard line on a knee by himself. That shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, the other side has uh, has gone through outlandish lengths to get to the point where they say, look, because students can see you and you're wearing Bremerton T-shirts or, or polo shirts, they see you as an authority figure. That alone 
is sufficient to coerce them into uh, into such a way that it violates the establishment. So it becomes an establishment of religion by the state of Washington just because they can see him engaged in 15 to 30 seconds of silent prayer. The First Amendment cannot possibly mean that. No, I, I think quite clearly it doesn't, and hopefully we find that out, you know, for sure here uh, very soon. So, so you. What happens? How, how does this? How do we get from you know you out there praying by yourself at the fifty yard line to the Supreme Court? Boy, that's been a long road. Seven years going into our Jeez. eighth, yeah, our eighth football seasons coming up. So that's a long. That's as long as I coached. Yeah. So it, it's so bizarre, and it really it started out just a breakdown in communication. The superintendent, a great guy. Everybody, these are my friends. Mm. You know, we worked together for almost a decade. So, you know, we really wanted to work this out. It wasn't until the district's lawyers got involved that they said, stop, you can't talk to us, you gotta go to the lawyers for, for all of this. And that's when First Liberty got involved because I was way out of my element. Yeah, and we're just simply asking for the ability to go to the 50-yard line by himself and pray. We thought this would be over in three weeks, which to him was half a football season, but it was certainly shorter than seven years of litigation on things. Yeah. They said, no, 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 to take a knee at sign of the prayer, that's gonna take him away from his job responsibilities after the game. Instead, how about you leave the field, go across the track, up the stairs, across the practice field, into the school building, down the hallway, and into the janitor's office, and you can pray there instead. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pretty sure that takes longer to get there than it does to get, just drop on a on knee in silent prayer. I'm pretty then, sure there's not a janitor's uh, closet prayer clause in the Constitution either, and I don't think yeah, it, I don't think. <laughs> well, and think of the message that that sends as well, <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that religion has to be hidden from public yeah. view, that prayer has to be hidden out of sight, as if it's some sort of vir virus to be stamped out or masked or whatever you want to call it. Uh, th th that has to be dis you know, dis uh, sent away from the, uh, the, the public school campus and things just because it's a teacher or a coach in this case. And that's where we were at right now. The Ninth Circuit has held that their version of the facts are true, that this was actually coercion by the, the, the coach. And here's the danger, is that if that's allowed to stand, then every teacher and coach who bows their head over their lunch in the cafeteria could be subject to termination. If a teacher or a, is wearing a yarmulke in the classroom or a hijab or a crucifix around the neck, they could lose their job for simply having those, quote, demonstrative religious activities in full view of other students. Mm. Well, again, this cannot mean, it cannot be what the First Amendment means when it comes to the Establishment Clause. And it certainly doesn't balance the rights of their free exercise rights under the Constitution as well. No one should have to choose between their faith and their livelihood when it comes to their, their life in this country. Yeah, I've noticed this particularly recently as they talked about this Florida law and they were trying to say, OK, well, what happens if a teacher who is gay and they want to come in and talk about their partner and what they did over the weekend? Now, of course, the bill doesn't prevent them from doing that. That was just a scare tactic. But but that is what it what what the left seems to think should happen to teachers and coaches who are faithful. They can't come in and talk about what they did at church over the weekend. If they do that, they're going to have the same experience you did. That's crazy. Yeah, we're going to end up driving good people like Coach Kennedy out of the system altogether. You know, another case that, I mean, it's reminded by your mug right there, even Colin Kaepernick, <laughs> right? It was happening right around the same time as this was for Coach Kennedy. Uh, and there was actually a school down the street from Coach Kennedy's school that the coaches wanted to protest the national anthem with their players. And so they would take a knee in solidarity with their players before the game. They kept their job and ended mm. up filing a brief in support of Coach Kennedy because they said, look, the same amendment that protects our right to protest the injustice by the first by the, the national anthem protects Coach Kennedy's right to be able to take a knee in silent prayer by himself at the 50 yard line after the game. Guys, yeah, you know, it's amazing because the Colin Kaepernick thing, one of the pushbacks against what conservatives said, hey, we don't like that you're disrespecting the flag, was they said, no, 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 we're just having a silent prayer. That was their defense when it was convenient. Uh, it's the attack in this situation. So what is the, what's the schedule like now? What, what, what comes next? Yeah, on April 25th, he'll finally have his day in court at the Supreme Court of the wow. United States. So we'll be there in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, he won't be able to even go inside to hear the argument. They've still had the, the, the courthouse closed to outsiders. Mm. But his, his case will be argued on the 25th, and by the end of January, or, I'm sorry, by the end of June, we'll have a decision as whether or not, uh, you know, all we asked for in this case was two things. Make him a coach again and let him go to the 50-yard line and pray by himself afterwards. That's it. We've not asked for any money, nothing else. We're just simply asking, let him be a coach, let him pray. So they did wind up firing you or they you got suspended? How did, what was the actual yeah, result? I was sus suspended halfway through the season and uh, every at the end of every year we, we, we don't, you know, reapply for our jobs. We get our annual evaluations and, you know, it, it says hire, do not rehire. Not only did they say do not rehire, they wrote it in great big 
letters. Do not rehire <laughs> on there. And oh. I happen to know the HR person, and um, that's a death sentence. Yeah, you're yeah. not getting rehired after that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's fascinating to hear you talk about all these people. You're you're so nice. <laughs> like you're so. It's like you don't seem to sh hold any any you know hate in your heart, or anger about this. You just want it to be corrected. Well, yeah, and you know, especially against the people in the school district. I, I mean, they're, they're, what are they going to do? And it happened to be where the HR lady that I know happens to be my wife. So, yeah. So <laughs> suing her and, you know, going through all this, is it's, it's been a road. Yeah, it's not about the school district. The school district yeah. are great. I mean, they work together for almost a decade, as so you said. So do they want to hire you back? Do they want you back, but they can't do it? What, what's their... Look, the superintendent is actually one of his better friends. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's like, it's out of my hands. It's in the hands of the lawyers right now. Yeah. And, and look, local attorneys very often kind of make this mistake about having to kind of censor religion everywhere it pops up on the school campus. That's fine. Those are innocent mistakes to be able to have, easily rectify. But they hired new attorneys by the time they got to the appellate stage. And, and it seems those come with much more of an agenda right now. Uh, and, and that's who we're arguing against at the, at the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and the facts that they tell and the facts that are reality are widely divergent. So it'll take the justices to sort this whole thing out on April 25th. Now, of course, you can't predict any results. Um, luckily, I think there's a, there's a much more, uh, there's a better court there now than there was a few years ago. Um, do you, what do you, how do you feel about this? Do you feel positive? Do you feel like what I think we all understand about the Constitution and the founding of this country is going to hold up in the year 2022? Yeah, I think so. If if the version of the facts and the law as the other side presents it right now are to win the day, we will live in a very different America. But if the justices, as they did four years ago when they were considering this case, or three years ago when they were considering this case the first time, four of the justices at that time said that this could be the, among the most egregious facts that they've considered in this context before, if they bear out to be true. We've only brought them more evidence that in fact is true. So. Mm. I expect the four justices will, that were there before will continue to be on this side. We just need to pick up one more. Uh, it's, it's a fool's errand to try to handicap the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> but, you know, as good as we can be feeling, I think that's where we're at right now. We just want to see Coach be a coach again and go to that 50-yard line after the game and take a knee in silent prayer by himself. That does not seem like too much to ask. That's all I'm saying. Mm. Coach, Jeremy, uh, thanks so much. And we're going to be following the close, uh, case closely. Love to have you back on when we, as, it, as it progresses. And... Because it's an important one. I mean, you know, religious liberty, I know the work you do, Jeremy, every day is centered on this. And it's such an important thing. And I feel like, you know, with all the stuff that's going wrong in the country, we've seen a lot of progress here. We've seen some good things happen in this arena, largely because of your work. Uh, Coach, I uh, wish you the best, and uh, we'll, we'll keep up on your story. It's going to be I very interesting I appreciate everything watch. you're doing, buddy. All right, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. As you may be aware, Monday is the 4th of July. Independence Day is here. Arguably the most important date in our nation's history. To celebrate, I'm sure loads of people will be wearing their most patriotic shirts with July 4th written all over them. I hear David Barton will be wearing an adult onesie made entirely from raw braided freedom. Mm -hmm. It's true. But I have another date that I think maybe we should all start rocking along with the Freedom Onesies. It's June 24th, 2022, you know, like seven days ago, because June 24th was the day our Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and hopefully saved millions of future human beings, giving them the chance to, you know, be alive. If you want to celebrate the momentous occasion with me, head to stewdoesmerch.com and get yourself a 624-22 item. We've got the hats. We've got the shirts. We've got the stickers. We even have the mugs now as well. Uh, by request, remind the baby-killing left that they're enormous losers and that the power of good will always prevail because evil is dumb. Mm -hmm. Also, we just a uh, heartwarming message or something about being together and working together towards whatever. June 24th, 2022, get your official merch at stewdoesmerch.com. I love these because, you know, the crazy people on the left won't know what, what you're talking about. They can't, they don't know how to read. They don't know what numbers, they don't know how to do that stuff. But you'll know, your friends will know, the people who support you in this cause will know. stewdoesmerch.com, get 10% off your entire order when you use the promo code stew 10 is the shirt. Get it at stewdoesmerch, the code is stew 10 You know, when you're buying a home, you can't just put in the promo code STU10 and save 10% on the home. 
It's, it's unbelievable. It doesn't work everywhere. It only works at studiosmerch.com. It does not work when you go to buy a home. Why? I guess you better be careful. You better make sure you have the best real estate agent possible to save yourself some money when you're buying a home. Or the alternative, to make sure you get the most money when you're selling a home. Yes, realestateagentsitrust.com exists for exactly this purpose because you need to have someone on your side in the biggest financial transaction you'll probably ever participate in. And that happens throughout life. You usually spend the most money on your house. The only thing that uh, goes above that is the next house. You can't screw these things up. You better have someone who's on your side that knows the market and you can trust. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Provide them with some basic info. The team will contact you, make uh, an introduction to the preferred agent in your town, and help you through the entire process. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now, realestateagentsitrust.com. So there's a story about the Utah County Attorney David Levitt. And, uh, you know, look... Glenn was talking about this story a lot on radio, and I didn't really follow it. I guess he's kind of like a, my impression was he's like a woke prosecutor. He's like doing all this criminal justice reform stuff. And the people of the county are like, we actually want criminals to go to jail. Like, that's kind of what they want. So there's been this back and forth. He was holding the position, uh, and he was up for re-election. And, you know, he had talked to the other guy, if I remember right, and he had said some things. He didn't really like this David Levitt guy as a, his job performance. So this guy got in touch with us somehow and decided he wanted to come on. Now, as I look at the schedule and I realize, uh, you know, he's about to come on, I, I say, Glenn, like, this is, the Supreme Court stuff's going to be coming out at the same time. You know, if we get the Dobbs decision, we need to like break into this interview, right? And he's like, well, you know, I, this guy is mad at me and we should just talk to him. We could talk to him. And I was like, well, Glenn, this is the biggest story in 50 years. Like we need to talk about it the second it happens. And he's like, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. It's not going to happen now. But if the Dobbs decision comes out right now, we'll have to, we'll have to break away. So he gets into this intro and he kind of gives him this, you know, his opinion. Like, I think he's been too soft, but he disagrees with me. David Levitt, come on the program. Levitt comes on. He gets two sentences into his first answer and the Dobbs decision comes out. <laughs> now, I am losing my mind back in the studio. I'm like, get this guy off the air. I don't want to hear another freaking word from him. Roe versus Wade was just overturned. I don't care about him. I don't care about his job. I don't care about anything. I don't care if he wins. I don't care if he loses. Get him off the radio. So Glenn, you know, seek, you know, sensing the same type of thing, breaks in and says, uh, you know, Mr. Levin, I'm so sorry. Like, I know we talked about this. I will get you on before the end of the show. We have huge breaking news. Roe versus Wade has been overturned. The Dobbs case is in. We need to get it to cover that. Now, the obvious sensible way to react in that situation is to say, uh, OK, Glenn, I totally understand. Like, I, you know, I, we've got our disagreements, but this is a huge story. I'll be happy to come back on in a couple of minutes. No, no. This guy's like, I can't believe you would cut me off in the middle of this. How? What agenda do you have, Glenn? He goes into this whole spiel. I honestly, I have never been more angry in my entire life. I wanted to just start dropping F-bombs all over the radio at this guy. Uh, sorry, your deal is not the biggest deal right now, bub. Anyway, good news to report, in case you happen to miss the details. The guy got crushed in his re-election attempt, losing 73 to 27. Good freaking riddance. Back in a minute. Hey, Stu, the biggest news story in recent memory is the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Is it? Is it? How about this instead? Taco Bell. Taco Bell is making a bunch of menu items with giant Cheez-Its. So forget your little Roe versus Wade thing. That's it's, it's important and everything. How about Taco Bell Crunchwrap Supremes? Look at these pictures. There's a giant Cheez-It in the middle of your Crunchwrap Supreme. Also, like what appears to be like a Mexican pizza on a Cheez-It. I would do anything to get myself one of these. I would, uh, I would murder families, entire families, to get access to these. I hope they are available after the power hour, because you get the power hour going, you want to go right to Taco Bell. It's not a good decision the next day, but that night, it's magical. Go to studospowerhour.com. Make sure you join us on July 8th. Don't miss it. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> 